talk about uh, the unveiling here, Sovereign Computing for a Free Future. It's probably not a huge uh, surprise for many of you who know uh, who I am and what we do at Start9. Um, that's what we do. We're trying to create sovereign computing. I will define that for you shortly, but the goal of sovereign computing, just as the goal of Bitcoin, is to create a more free future for ourselves and our children and uh, all future generations. So, um, with that in mind, we'll get started. Now, a little bit more preface. Uh, this is going to be something of a mix between that kind of a talk, right? This, like, what's it all about, philosophic, um, and also some uh, quite technical. So, I'm going to be diving into uh, some, we'll call them mid level technical details of how we do some of the things that we do, um, sort of where we've been, where we are and where we're going uh, with particular emphasis on networking because that is one of the bigger challenges that we at Start9 and the world are facing right now, which is how do you get parties from around the world to communicate with one another in a way that is private and persistent and all the rest. So uh, with that in mind, let's go on. Uh, this is going to be more of a prop, by the way. I'm not going to be just like reading off of this. Most of these slides are just going to be like, some of them are only going to have like three words on them just to kind of cue me to what to talk about next. Um, but let's do a little background, okay, of computing, starting with um, the one that we like to start with mostly, like not going way, way back, but starting with the more modern era of the 1970s and the advent of personal computing with the microprocessor. Um, this is a super opinionated and brief summary of these various computing paradigms, we'll call them. Personal computing, using a computer to access, manage, and process your own data locally. Okay, it was siloed, uh, it was really powerful, it was really cool, but it was, uh, it was just on the computer in your home. And if you wanted to move anything off of that computer, it was a, you know, a, a hard disk or floppy disk and you're moving it around. Um, 1990s, I don't know if there's a word for this. I just made one up called web computing. It basically means, you know, the internet starts to go mainstream um, and you can now use your personal computer, which is largely siloed, to uh, access uh, someone else's data on their computer. Now, maybe you're doing some cloudy stuff there, but mostly you're surfing around in order to gather data, bring it down, and then do something with it on your computer, even if it's just to view it. Um, and now you have the 2010s with cloud computing. And it was really before the 2010s, but it didn't really start to take off, at least for like public clouds, until the 2010s. And this is using a computer, your computer, to rent time and space on someone else's computer to access, manage, and process your own data. So we've now essentially turned your computer into a remote control that's accessing and renting time and space on somebody else's computer for the sake of device synchronicity, basically. This is so that you can put the source of truth up there so that no matter where, you're, where you go in the world, no matter what device you're using, they all learn that source of truth. That was why we did that. Um, now the 2020s, uh, if the trend continues, I'm calling it nightmare computing, which is using a computer to rent time, space on someone else's computer to access, manage, and process your own data that is collected by robots they control. Okay, this is the IoT push, where if you were to walk into any Apple or Google or Microsoft or Amazon boardroom, I guarantee you one of the top initiatives of their uh, company for the coming decade is to proliferate smart devices into your life that are all feeding their mega cloud so that they can learn and know everything about you, uh, influence your choices, and ultimately control your physical world, which is why I call it nightmare computing, right? You can imagine uh, saying the wrong thing and your car just driving you to jail, right? Or, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, or, the, you know, the temperature in your house going up, right? brings a whole new meaning to lockdowns and turning the heat up on the population. Like you can, you can physically control people's worlds in this model of computing. And I think, you know, thankfully, that this is most people's red lines, right? A lot of people are okay with this Google's reading my emails world. A lot less people are okay with Alexa is listening world. And we've seen that, right? A lot of people do not bring these smart devices into their home, especially cameras, security devices, um, for fear that that is in, an invasion of privacy. So the fact that these companies are pushing for this is actually good news 
because it's raising awareness to the, uh, to the existence of the problem in the first place. Sovereign computing. This is what we want to see. Uh, and not just what we want to see, but what we think is going to happen, whether it's us or somebody else or a combination, which is using a computer to manage, access, process your own data on another computer, also yours, collected by robots you control, thus forming an independent digital territory ruled by a sovereign. Okay? This is the idea of a temporary autonomous zone, if any of you have read uh, some of that literature, but ultimately when you control the hardware, the data, and the lines of communication for a variety of devices in your own life, you are essentially a sovereign of a digital territory, which is why we call it sovereign computing. Uh, another alternative word, just for sort of clarity's sake, is independent computing. Basically means that you are doing computer stuff, including robots, that is independent. You are not dependent on trusted third parties to perform uh, these actions. Okay, um, let, me, let me back up before I get into that. Sovereign computing uh, has always been possible, okay? Um, today, if you are sufficiently technical and patient and have the bandwidth, you can, with extreme effort, um, set up a, a sovereign computing network, okay? Uh, you just have to you know, get your Linux machine, and then you know, hop on uh, the web, download your favorite open source software, compile it, um, containerize it, get it running, configure the network interfaces, uh, configure the software itself, spin it up, make sure all its dependencies are met, that if, you know, if it's LND, it depends on Bitcoin, and Bitcoin's installed, and that they can communicate, you know, and then make sure you monitor it for health. Uh, you know, it, you're done, right? Everything I just said is, even very few people in this room would do that. It's not that, they couldn't, there's actually probably a lot of people in this room that could do that and have done that to some extent. But if you're talking about a holistic solution here where by and large, without having to think about it on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, you are engaged in this kind of computing, uh, probably almost no one in this room uh, has done that. And so it's just not a practical thing, even though it is a possible thing. So if you want it to be a practical thing and you want it to be a standard, these are the areas that we have to nail, okay? Um, and these should come of some, you know, to no surprise, this is computer stuff, right? So you need hardware. Uh, I'm gonna dive into each one of these individually and hopefully quickly. Uh, you need programs, and by programs, I mean uh, applications, services, and nodes. So quick definitional thing here because we get a lot of confusion around these different things. Uh, an application, and again, these are our definitions. They kind of align, perf you know, maybe not perfectly with Web Merriam-Webster definitions, but an application is a program that uh, is designed to interface with a human, okay? So there's some sort of human interface, usually a graphical user interface, uh, and that's sort of an app. We call those applications or apps. Um, services are things that are designed to run per perpetually, and they sort of live behind the scenes, uh, and are designed to serve, provide data and processing services to apps or other services. And then you have nodes. Uh, nodes is any service or app that is connected on a peer-to-peer -peer federated network, okay? So sometimes something can be both a service and a node, um, like Bitcoin. Uh, sometimes something can be both a service and an app because it's providing services and it has a user interface. So these things are not mutually exclusive. They can be sort of combined together um, but anyway, they're all programs, okay? Um, awareness, we need people to be aware of the existence and nature of the current computing paradigm, namely cloud computing, rapidly transforming into nightmare computing that dominates uh, planet Earth. And um, to know that there is an alternative, even if they don't fully understand it, uh, to know that we're not fated to go down this track. Uh, and that's where education comes in. So education is like once somebody is aware of a problem, can we catch them? Can we grab them and say, oh my God, let me tell you more about this problem. Let me educate you on the, on the solutions. Everyone in this room knows this because you've been doing it with Bitcoin. As people discover problems with money, we're like ready to pounce on them and tell them all about you know, how the Fed works and why Bitcoin is the solution. Um, we need to do the same thing for computing in general. Uh, it's kind of on a slower track because it's not as like hot and fire and exciting as Bitcoin at the moment, but it is uh, absolutely essential just like Bitcoin is. Um, and finally, you need an operating system. 
um, the operating system is the bridge between the hardware, the programs, and the user, right? It's the thing that ties this all together, not the education and awareness, but it ties together the other components of the computing system itself. Um, and we see this in the past with like Microsoft, um, IBM, uh, Apple, right? In the 1970s and 80s, that's what brought personal computers to mass market was an operating, an innovation in operating systems, right? It was off the command line, off the MS-DOS, and into the, the GUI, the, the point and click operating system is what enabled personal computers to take over and, uh, and proliferate. And the same thing is necessary now for uh, server-side technology, right? Running services and nodes um, currently require quite a bit of technical expertise. And there's a Start9 is not the only one addressing that problem. We are addressing it in a very different way, though. So I'm going to dive into these again very quickly here. Hardware. Uh, I'm not going to talk about hardware a lot, but I'm going to go over this. Hardware needs to be available, affordable, performant, reliable, and secure. It mostly is. This is not a huge problem. Programs. Uh, we need quality web application services and nodes. Uh, we need quality native clients or not, right? I don't really care as much about native iOS and Android and Windows and Mac and Linux apps because everything can be done through the browser. That's how it used to be. We pivoted away because of the App Store and Apple primarily, and you can make uh, web native applications running as progressive web applications feel, look, and behave just like native applications. We believe that PWAs uh, are not the entire future, but will be a, have a dominant place in computing in the future. Um, if, I'm not going to dig into exactly what those are. And then lastly, um, we have to compete with well-funded closed source projects, right? So they're the ones with all the money. Uh, the user experience is better. The user interfaces are better. Uh, the marketing around them is better. Um, but, you know, hopefully with Bitcoin succeeding uh, longer term, there's a lot more funding and willingness to support uh, open source software. Uh, and hopefully, with a computing paradigm uh, like the one we are creating, there's actually better distribution for open source software, which means more incentive for people to create it, if for no other reason than reach and reputation. So, um, that's it. Uh, I'm not too worried about this. This doesn't concern me that much, because the world of open source software um, is is pretty rich. Not money rich, but like rich in in you know, examples and quality for decades, right? Passionate people working on nothing have built their own open source software. Um, and so it, it's not where it needs to be. It's not as performant and good and clean as closed source stuff, but it's pretty rich and it's getting better. And again, with more funding and better distribution, I think that we're gonna catch up um, to some of the closed source stuff. Operating system. I'm gonna hang on this for a little bit because it's really where we come in. Right? This is start nine. This is what we're doing. Uh, just like the, those who came before us, the Microsoft and Apple, that's where they started. That's where we're starting because this is the glue that makes the whole computing paradigm possible. Um, you might just say, well, Linux. Linux is an operating system that people use to you know, self-host any variety of open source software, and I agree. But how many people in <laughs> the numbers are going to be way higher in this room use Linux to self-host an entire ecosystem of open source software and are successful at it and do it across. It, again, this room's gonna have more. General population, it's essentially zero, okay? And it's zero because Linux is, does, Linux for running self-hosted open source software on P2P and federated networks is not for non-technical people. That's for technical people. So when I say an operating system, what I'm talking about is some sort of layer above distro of Linux that caters to totally non-technical people, empowering them to become a systems administrator, right? To enable a non-technical person to own and operate successfully and in perpetuity a personal server and fleet of internet connected devices. That's the problem we set out to solve uh, three years ago now. Can't believe we're three. Uh, and we've come a long way. Um, so what does it need to do? Uh, it needs to do program management, right? You have to be able to uh, discover, install, uh, configure, monitor, run, um, you know, any variety of open source uh, self-hosted software. Um, it needs to do network management. Uh, it needs to make sure that these things are available 
to, uh, to you and others potentially if you're trying to serve this content to, other, to the outside world. And it also eventually, which it does not do today, needs to do device management, meaning I should be able to, hopefully in the not too distant future, be able to you know, go get a camera uh, adhering to some open source specification, possibly purchased from Start9, uh, drill it into your wall, tap your phone to it, and have that camera without any configuration whatsoever discover the personal server that's already established in your home and immediately just start syncing video footage to it such that you can go anywhere in the world, open up a totally private anonymous connection and watch live video footage from your home without the involvement of a single trusted third party. This operating system has to do that. Okay, um, so yeah, let me talk about kind of where where we've been, okay? When we started this, the best approach to getting like some self-hosted software up and running was to have a device, and we'll call it a pseudo operating system, that just is designed to run a single or a couple services that are kind of hard-coded into the binary, right? So we're gonna say, this is like what the early CASA node did. So CASA was the, the pioneer of the Bitcoin and Lightning plug and play node. Um, and the way that they did it was, you know, it's here's an OS and you plug it in and it just sort of starts these things up, right? So its primary goal was to bootstrap you onto select services as quickly as possible. Um, and what we've seen since then is that there's a few projects that do the same thing, right? It's we're going to bootstrap you as fast as possible on to running this entire suite of services. And that's basically the be all and end all of the, o of the OS, is just this bootstrapping process. It's like if, some, if your best technical friend came over, pulled out your computer, and just installed a bunch of stuff on it, and then started them all, and then was like, okay, here's the addresses where you can use them, and then left, okay? That doesn't leave you in a position to actually personally administer this thing, expand the service offerings, Make, you know, manage the dependencies between them, monitor them for health, receive notifications, view the logs, uh, expand the storage. There's just so many things that you will need to do with this system over time that are not solved by the, okay, you're up and running, see you later uh, type of solution. So that is where we have been spending the last few years is building out the primitives of the operating system, which aren't always as glamorous, that will not only get you up and running with a ton of services, but will then allow you to manage those services in perpetuity and, you know, in, and expand uh, on them as well. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna spend a little bit more time. Uh, networking. So, a networking solution for this model of sovereign computing must, uh, or, you know, ideally, nails all of these. Zero configuration. The user should not have to do anything. Instant bootstrap connections should be established as near instantly as possible. Low latency, once a connection is established, it should be very fast. Uh, resilient, right? Whatever networking solution you come up with it must be resistant to attack. Uh, it must be private uh, and globally addressable, right? Because you want to be able to reach this stuff from anywhere in the world, right? You don't want to have to be on your home network um, in order to use your computing uh, fleet. Um, okay. So private, by the way, has kind of like two parts of privacy. Uh, there's kind of privacy and anonymity. Right? Privacy um, is, does anyone know that this conversation is taking place? Does anyone know that this, you know, this website or service exists? Whereas anonymity is, if you tell somebody about this, or somebody knows of its existence, can they correlate it to your identity? And in the later slides, I actually break down privacy and anonymity into those two things. Here's where we started, Tor, okay? When we launched the first version of Embassy OS, both the operating system, dashboard, and every service you installed on the device uh, was automatically hosted on a brand new, never before seen, freshly generated Tor V3 hidden service, where the private key 
uh, for that website is created you know, on the fly, and then the public key is actually the URL. So these are blah, 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 dot onion. And these are created when you install the service on the fly. What this did was it meant that with zero configuration, you could just plug this thing in, it pops out a Tor URL, and then you can visit that Tor URL from anywhere in the world on a Tor-enabled browser, of course, and now you're talking to this device in your home without trusting any uh, third parties, right? There are third parties in between, but they're not trusted. That's how Tor works, right? So you're using onion routing similar to Lightning Network. Uh, and that worked great. It's zero config, it's resilient, it's private, uh, as in nobody even knows that this thing exists because V3 hidden service URLs are blinded, and so you know it's not listed in any kind of public way that somebody would just know. Uh, it's anonymous, even if they do find the Tor v3 hidden URL and they do visit it and see what's being hosted there, they don't know who it is, they don't know that it's you. Uh, and it's globally addressable. Anywhere in the world, even in places that censor Tor, there are ways to get to it. Problem with Tor, and these are huge red X's, is it is not instant bootstrap and it is not low latency. Okay? Not only is it not instant bootstrap, it sometimes doesn't bootstrap at all. And once you are connected, it's still very slow. It feels like going back to the 1990s internet dial-up type of stuff, okay? It's very slow. So it's ultimately unacceptable for mass market use. It was a great way to start because it hit the things that matter most, but it sacrificed mass market um, uh, acceptability. So we introduced LAN. Uh, LAN, local area network. Um, in addition to every service spinning up on a tour, uh, hidden service. It also spins up as a dot local, local area network service, such that if you're home, if you happen to be connected to the same local area network, same Wi-Fi, you can access your services by visiting their unique dot local URL, which is actually the exact same as the dot onion URL, except with dot local at the end, and HTTPS instead of HTTP at the beginning. And the HTTPS is for SSL, and so your embassy serves its own root certificate authority such that you can, even on your LAN, feel secure in communicating with your device. So I'm on the phone in one part of the house, talking to the server on the other part of the house, and even you know my malicious wife sniffing the traffic cannot see what I'm doing, okay? Um, now, I, it's not globally addressable. That's a massive red X, right? This doesn't work from anywhere else in the world. Uh, and, it, and then private and anonymous are sort of grayed out because they are private and anonymous to anyone outside the LAN, but they are not private and anonymous to anyone inside the LAN. So it's yes and no, they're private and anonymous. It depends on who you're trying to be private and anonymous from. It's, if it's someone connected to your Wi-Fi network, no. Ultimately, they could see who's talking to who. They can't read the traffic, that's encrypted. But they can see that something is there and that it's you, okay? Um, but if the LAN is secure and somebody's outside the LAN, they have no idea. All right, here's what's coming. So right now, Tor and LAN is what's available. This is the next stop, ClearNet. ClearNet has a lot of definitions, depending on who you are, how you define ClearNet. We define ClearNet as DNS plus SSL, OK? It's what most people think of as the internet. It's .com. It's HTTPS .com. That's clear DNS uh, plus SSL. The reason we're doing this is not because we love it and think it's the ultimate solution to all of our problems. We're doing this for adoption, right? We're doing this because businesses, organizations, schools, churches cannot adopt this technology for their own uh, uh, organizational usage, their employees and customers, uh, congregation members, you name it. They can't adopt this and at the same time tell everyone in the room, all right, everyone, go get the Tor browser, put in this Onion URL, uh, enter a username and password, and we'll all be chatting privately on this device. It's just not going to happen. They want to say, go to blah, 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 dot com, enter your username and password, and we're all chatting on a server. Um, and by the way, it's totally private. Uh, we can't be censored for the things we're saying anymore. Uh, and by the way, it's free, right? So you don't have to pay SaaS subscription costs. If you are an organization of uh, about 200 members, we ran the numbers once, I forgot them uh, right now, but if you're an organization of 200 members and you're paying for Slack, it's somewhere in the range of $5,000 a month, okay? Now that might not matter 
to a 200 person organization that has VC funding, et cetera. But um, you know, if you care about money and want to keep of it as much of it as you can, then you would rather have a free for life Slack alternative that you pay a one time upfront capital cost for the hardware rather than paying $5,000 a month forever. So this isn't just about privacy and censorship resistance. Um, it's also about efficiency and cost, right? This is just a better model. Um, and with ClearNet and DNS, um, you know, ClearNet DNS plus SSL support, which is coming uh, imminently, so this is our next networking uh, interface that's being added, uh, you will be able to host your embassy, meaning its primary dashboard, and any or all of your services on uh, one or more domains, any domain that you control, and or any subdomain of those domains. And it's totally a la carte, right? So the way that this will work is you will go get a domain from Namecheap or GoDaddy or whatever. Uh, you know, we'll call it matthill.dev. Um, and you go get that domain, and then you turn on um, dynamic DNS. This is a setting that most uh, domain registrars and DNS providers offer. After you turning on dynamic DNS, it's going to spit out some auth token, okay? Now what is contained in that auth token varies from these different providers, but there's a client on the other side called um, DD client that knows how to handle all this stuff, so it's perfectly fine. Basically it's gonna spit out a, a token, we'll call that, just a gibberish number of strings, uh, letters, and numbers, okay? You go into your embassy, click add a domain. It's going to ask you for this string and maybe some other information. Basically, it needs to authenticate that you control that domain. So you put this information in and hit save. If it successfully pings Namecheap or GoDaddy and says, yep, we got what we need, clearly the person who had access to that portal also had access here, boom, it's connected, right? Now you can selectively go to any one or more of the services that are installed on your device and just click enable ClearNet, okay? So you click enable ClearNet and it'll ask you to select between the domains that you have verified. Could it, I only named one, but you could have added five different domains to select the domain that you, and then optionally add a subdomain, right? So for example, if I wanted my embassy, my server itself, the dashboard to be hosted on matthill.dev, I would just select matthill.dev, but then if I wanted my BTC pay server so that I could host a, uh, you know, an e-commerce store on a ClearNet website so that people could buy products from me with Bitcoin and Lightning, I would put it at, you know, BTC pay or my store.matthill.dev, and now it's just done. So the configuration, it's not zero, but it's actually very minimal, not just for business standards, but like any individual could do this very simply. It's going to be about a, you know, two paragraph tutorial. It's not that hard but it's also not zero, so it gets a red X. And it's not private or anonymous, okay? That you are just throwing privacy and anonymity uh, out the door under this solution, but businesses don't care, right? If you're a business or organization, you're, you're not primarily concerned with this. You're primarily concerned with, um, you know, cost, censorship resistance. Now, privacy and anonymity, if both are compromised, you're not totally censorship resistant, but it depends on your threat model. Um, like who is trying to censor you, all right? Ultimately, uh, if the answer is a uh, three-letter three -letter agency and they wanna take down your website because you know, at store.matthill.dev, illegal things are being sold, um, then they can, but here's the catch. The Tor URL is still there, right? Because we built that first. So what they get is instead of a broad daylight store that they hate, they get a dark store that they hate and can't do anything about, which we think acts as a, a deterrent from censoring the broad daylight store in the first place. So it's not that we intend to fall back to Tor, it's that the ability to fall back to Tor makes the ClearNet uh, attack less likely. So that's coming and coming soon. Um, along with the Embassy Pro device, which is a much more powerful uh, device, uh, we yeah, it'll be a, a great fit for businesses and organizations to serve hundreds or even thousands uh, of people, depending on uh, how concurrent those requests are. Okay, let's talk about another way to do networking, okay? Uh, and there's been some chatter about this because there's a few different projects out there, some pretty cool ones, that are uh, using one form or another of, of hole punching to do networking between uh, devices where one of those devices is, is on a local area network behind uh, a NAT, right? Um, 
how do you, how do these devices communicate with each other? So in this model, this is just traditional hole punching, all right? Um, by the way, I'm not getting into the gritty of this. I'm doing the, the like mid-level talk here, okay? Just to kind of get the point across. First request, that home, okay. This is your server or service that's running on that server. This is you at a distance. Uh, and this is some third-party server, okay? Hole punching, traditional hole punching, involves a third-party server, and I'll get into why that's not great in a minute. Um, so you, at your home, uh, and this is just software, like not you as a human doing this, but the software running on, on your machine would inform this third-party server uh, of some information about you. Essentially, it's just going to open up a connection, right? It's going to open up a TCP connection, and it's just going to hold that connection open. This thing, and it's going to give it an ID, right? This is going to say, okay, here's an ID. And that ID is usually like a hash of a public key, right? It's cryptographic material. So you give it an ID, and you open up a TCP connection with it. Now, me, somewhere else, I want to talk to that ID, right? That ID, let's say it corresponds to BTC pay server, right? So I obviously can give that ID to myself, because I can log into my embassy, see what that ID is, and then go somewhere else and use it to talk to BTC pay. Or I could give that ID to somebody else, and they could talk to my BTC pay if they wanted to visit my store. So I make a request to the, this thing is called a discovery server in most cases, or some nuance of that word. So I make a request to the discovery server, and I'm like, here's an ID. All I need to do is give it an ID. That discovery server looks up the ID, because it received it from the home, and then maps that to uh, an IP address. This is the IP address of my, my router in my house. And it asks the router, so request three, right? So it now reaches into my home, and it says, quick, give me an ephemeral port at which you can be reached, right? So this is the IP address doesn't change. I mean, it does every once in a while, but we're going to ignore that piece of this for right now. The IP address of your home is the IP address of your home, and every once in a blue moon, it'll change. But assuming it hasn't changed yet, basically, the discovery server is going to reach out to my home and say, quick, give me a port and by the way, they're asking for this ID, right? Like, I don't know what this ID refers to, but somebody is dialing, this ID is like a phone number. Somebody is dialing this ID, please give me a, a port where whatever's behind, whatever that ID refers to can be reached. So then my BTC pay server on my embassy hands a port back to the discovery server. The discovery server forwards that IP address and port to me, my browser, my computer, wherever I am, and then I, can dial BTC Pay directly on that ephemeral port. And I think 300 seconds or so is the time that I have to make that call before the port vanishes, right? And this is just how routers work. Right? This is firewalls and networking, and you know it's all designed to keep your home safe, but ultimately it makes it very hard to communicate with things in your home when you're at a distance. So I can now dial BTC Pay server in my home behind the router at an ephemeral port without having to set up port forwarding on my router, without having to involve a DNS server, without having to use ClearNet or anything like that. It's sort of just magic. And then this connection, right, could be uh, TCP, it could be UDP, it could be running WebRTC, it could be for a video chat, anything like that. And we have instances of this. So there's um, SyncThing uses a protocol similar to this. Uh, Magic Wormhole, if you've heard of that, it's really cool, uses this. IPFS uh, uses a, a form of hole punching. Um, there's also some company that's currently closed source and getting a lot of hype for some reason called Hole Punch uh, that is using hole punching, obviously, um, and um, and others as well. I think um, Impervious AI, though they haven't launched yet, is uh, using some form of hole punching as well. So this is a very common practice. The problem is there's that discovery server in the middle. This is a middleman, okay? <laughs> so it's zero config. Um, you don't need to do much to make this work. I know it sounded complicated, but it'll kind of just work. Uh, it has instant bootstrap, low latency, globally uh, addressable. It's not private, it's not anonymous, it's not resilient. You're very dependent on the discovery server. If the discovery server goes down, you can't communicate to the device in your home. Now, the way that you can solve this is by having a network of discovery servers, right? Where you're now creating this new network, but then you run into problems of, well, you're solving Bitcoin's problem. You're, you're solving this problem of, of consensus of how do I reach this discovery server? This one goes down, how do I reach that one? And 
you know, are they sharing this information with each other such that no matter how many are down, I can still access my device? So it's a very hard problem to solve. Um, and it is a problem that a lot of these hole punching strategy um, pro projects are attempting to solve. Um, but ultimately, we're not pursuing them. What we're doing instead is we're doing a different kind of hole punching. Um, so we invented this, uh, and we're calling it Tor to Peer, or T2P for short. It's a, a form of hole punching that does not involve a trusted third party. Um, but there is a trade off, and I'll get to that in a second. In this model, one calls the thing in the home directly. And it's able to do that because it's doing it over Tor, right? Tor has already solved the hole punching problem. Tor is a, it inherently involves hole punching, right? So that's why you didn't have to worry about port forwarding and NAT traversal and all that with um, Tor, is because it's, the way Tor works is what's in the house is creating outbound TCP connections, right? There's nothing needs to call in. They're all rendezvousing at, within the Tor network. So what I can do is I can actually dial BTC pay server uh, directly over its Tor address using a different protocol. This isn't Tor, right? So I'm going to make this request over the Tor network, but when received by BTC pay, right, it's not just going to respond. It's not just going to respond and onion route things back to me with the website I'm, I'm requesting. Instead, what it's going to onion route back to me is an ephemeral IP and port. Okay, so the, the, the service itself, the embassy itself, is functioning as its own discovery server. Really? Jesus. All, every time. <laughs> I just, I, I, no, it's not your fault. I'm just, I, I don't know why I talk so much. Um, so it's going to respond with an ephemeral, uh, an IP and ephemeral port such that I can then fire up a direct UDP or TCP connection with BTC pay server in my home. So what this does is it gets rid of the low latency portion of Tor, okay? So I no longer have to deal with Tor being slow. The only part of Tor being slow that I have to deal with is the initial request. So I go to connect to this website or ask data from this service, and it's going to be like, you know, a spinner for a second, and then boom, lightning fast after that. So it's like fast Tor, okay? You can imagine this is just like Tor on steroids. But it still relies on Tor to conduct the bootstrapping. And so, as we've seen, Tor being under attack is not 100% reliable. But we think it's a great next step um, as we move towards more and more permanent solutions to this. Uh, you also lose anonymity. Because if you were to give out this Tor address to somebody else, like, hey, you can visit my BTC Pay store at this Tor URL, and their client and your server are both using T2P, then as soon as that connection is made, you're literally sharing your IP address with them. <laughs> so anyone who visits this Tor URL now knows your IP address. That's not that bad of a thing in most cases, all right? It's bad if you're, again, three-letter agency, uh, you know, running from them, but for an average person, that, that's not going to tell them exactly where you live. They might be able to do some kind of, uh, you know, very limited geographic uh, location. Luckily, both ClearNet and Tor, because ClearNet exposes your IP as well. Um, luckily, both ClearNet and Tor, you can solve the I don't want people to know my IP by uh, putting a proxy server in, in on a on a you know uh, server somewhere else, something with a static IP. So it's a super. It would be a super dumb thing. It would be just a dumb proxy server. Uh, you could throw it up on uh, you know either a, a business that has a static IP or on DigitalOcean or wherever you want um, and have, have the, the discovery server Tor uh, T2P resolution, instead of returning the IP of your home, it would return the IP of the cloud device along with the ephemeral port of your home and then just proxy uh, information. So very limited uh, speed lost, but the, you regain uh, anonymity. So it's like an extra piece of configuration that most people won't do because it's not part of their threat model. But if you really did want to do it, then it would be trivial to do. I'm going to stop um, because the next two get into the last pieces of kind of what we need to bring sovereign computing uh, you know, to the world. 
Um, so I guess I have five minutes, I'll, I'll breeze through them. So these are uh, awareness and education. There's been a lot of talk about awareness and education at this conference, really good stuff. So I don't need to like harp on this. It's mostly Bitcoin oriented. Um, so for us, uh, awareness means this. It means kind of waiting for the failure of centralized information systems because nobody is going to adopt a brand new computing paradigm that causes them to rethink how computers and humans interact and adopt these new devices and yada yada unless the old thing is failing, right? A solution without a problem is, is a dead project. Uh, but we're pretty confident this is going to happen, okay? So what we need to happen, we don't want to happen because it means bad news for the world, but it's gonna happen is, you know, continued failure of information system, information systems and then the absolute failure of centralized information systems. Um, they're just dying. Uh, it is, um, you know, if data is the new gold, it means every cloud provider is a bank vault. Uh, honey pots of data are magnets for attack. Uh, intermedi intermediated systems are less efficient. Uh, they carry risk of censorship and extortion. Uh, censorship, surveillance, cost, theft, extortion, you name it. Like this is all just built into the model of computing that we have today. It is very often expressed in, in money, right? That's why Bitcoin was so front and center and like this uh, it was sort of the, the spearhead of this entire movement started with Bitcoin. It makes perfect sense why, because that's where this has been expressed most uh, apparently. But ultimately the entire computing model is just broken and subject to the same, um, the same failure models that, that money was. Um, something we talk about a lot is that, you know, the way that SaaS companies, cloud companies, basically the play in Silicon Valley for the last 20 years monetize uh, is in large part your data, right? That's why they're giving away products for free is because then you just feed them data and that data is gold and it's super valuable and they can do all sorts of things with it. Um, well, that is changing because people are starting to say no to that. There's awareness of this practice now. We were very naive at first and now we're a bit more informed and ironically, that awareness is actually leading to political action. So there's now like laws coming out that are telling, you know, app developers, SaaS companies, cloud providers, like you have to ask users if you want to collect their data. They have to opt into this practice. And I don't know anyone that ever says yes, not one, right? So if, if they're truly not collecting it, if they're truly honoring your, um, you know, your desire in this case, then they're not going to be able to collect and monetize your data in the same way that they had before, uh, which leaves them wanting for revenue. That's a huge revenue stream that's drying up very rapidly. And the only way that they're going to be able to backfill those revenues that we've been able to think of is subscriptions, right? So uh, the subscriptions are coming. The free tiers are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. They're going to uh, skyrocket for businesses first, but eventually every app on your phone Every piece of software you use, every website you visit is going to be pay to play. Everything is going to be charged. And that we think might actually be the primary driving force of our model because our model is zero fees ever forever, right? There's no way to charge subscription fees with the software you're running on your own server. Uh, if there was, then it wouldn't be your server. That's kind of the point, right? So, um, and then finally, just education, right? So once somebody has figured out that there's a problem and there might be a solution out there, we've got to capture them, educate them, and convert them, get them using the technology. Um, certain ideologies are predisposed to this. Uh, Bitcoiners, for one, uh, you know, it's the orange pill. Uh, we are the red pill to Bitcoin's orange pill, right? We are the, the, the <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we are the teeth to the libertarian tongue. Uh, libertarians talk a lot. They've always talked a lot. They haven't been able to get much done in the decades um, where they've tried, but uh, now we have technology uh, and a means to actually accomplish uh, a societal organization that most libertarians uh, stand for uh, with technology. So these are our two target markets. This is, this is why we're at Bitcoin Conference. Um, not only because we're Bitcoiners, but because no Bitcoiners will get it before everybody else does. Thank you, Matt. Uh, everybody stay where you are. We've got a little bit more for you here, so do not move, do not touch that dial.